Our fourth reading is from the book of Genesis. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. And at sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone for a pillow and lay down to sleep. And as he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down on it. At the top of the stairway stood God, who said, I am the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth, and they will cover the land from east to west and north to south. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What is more, I will be with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. I will someday bring you safely back to this land. I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. Then Jacob woke up and said, Surely God is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the gateway to heaven. The next morning he got up very early. He took the stone he had used as a pillow and set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it, and he named the place Bethel, House of God. And may God speak to us through these verses today. Jacob is one of the great patriarchs, as we call them, of the Bible, by which we mean one of the earliest ancestors of the Hebrew people. And there are some great stories in the Bible about his life and his faith. But in our reading today, he's a troubled young man with a lot of problems. He's running away from home because his older brother Esau plans to kill him. It seems that Jacob tricked Esau out of his birthright and blessing from their father, Isaac. And back in those days, the birthright and the blessing were very important things, and they always went to the eldest son. Whoever had the birthright received most of the family inheritance and became head of the family. The blessing of God for your future, for your descendants, Esau lost all that. Now, to be perfectly fair, if you read the story, some of you may know it, he didn't just lose it, he actually sold it to his younger brother Jacob. And he sold it for the phenomenal sum of a bowl of stew. He came home hungry one day from a hard day's work. He found Jacob with a big pot of stew on the stove. And he begged Jacob for a bowl, but Jacob refused unless he saw signed over his birthright. And he saw agreed. Now also, to be fair, this little scheme was cooked up by their mother, Rebecca. She loved Jacob more than Esau, and she wanted him to have the birthright. So they conspired to trick Esau and their father, Isaac. Now talk about a dysfunctional family. Talk about sibling rivalry. The name Jacob itself can be translated as deceiver and one who takes by the heel. When these brothers were born, Jacob came out gripping Esau's heel of his foot. And that was a symbol that Jacob would take something of Esau's, that he would get the better of him in life. Now, frankly, too, we also get the impression that Esau is not very bright. He doesn't seem to appreciate the importance of the birthright. It was certainly worth more than a bowl of stew. And when Esau realizes what has happened, he gets angry and he swears revenge on Jacob, who then leaves home to save his life. And that's where we pick up the story today, with Jacob alone in a barren wilderness, getting ready to settle down to sleep out in the open with a stone for a pillow. Now, Jacob's journey has been a long one, and this may not be the first night that he sleeps along the way, but this particular night he has a dream. And he dreams of, well, the older versions, most of us probably grew up hearing about this ladder 
reaching to heaven with angels ascending and descending on it. You know, the old hymn, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher and higher. Anybody know that one? How does a ladder have rounds? It doesn't really sound like the kind of ladder we use to climb a roof. That word that is often translated as that ladder actually means something more like a ramp or, as our reading today says, a staircase. And experts identify this as the ramps on ancient temple towers. Now, these towers were similar to pyramids. And you've probably seen them, these ancient Middle Eastern pyramid-type structures. And on the outside, they had angled staircases or ramps all the way up to climb to the top. And at the top of these was a shrine to some ancient god. In Jacob's dream, angels are winding their way up and down the sides of this tower, and instead of a shrine at the top, Jacob sees a vision of God. And God says to him, I am the God of your grandfather Abraham and of your father Isaac. And God makes these really great promises to Jacob, especially the promise that God is with him and always will be. And in these promises, Jacob hears, I think, well, here I am. I'm this rather terrible person who's done a rather terrible thing, and here I am kind of paying for it, running for my life out in the middle of nowhere, and suddenly God makes these promises. God must love me. God still loves him. God forgives him. God can still do great things through him. Even through him. Now Jacob's reaction to such good news is to cry out, Surely God is in this place and I did not know it. He didn't know God was there. Back in those days, people believed in many gods. And they believed that their gods had power only in certain places. Like, for example, you'd have the god of a certain village, the god of a tribe, the god of a certain region, and so on. But now Jacob discovers that the god of his grandfather and father, and now him, is greater than that. This god is greater than his own limited beliefs. God is more than Jacob's own limited understanding of God. Jacob realizes that God is not limited to a place. In fact, God is not limited to time. God is always with people wherever they go and whatever they go through. That was a rather unique concept in this historical period. A God who was not limited by region, but instead the development of the consciousness of an eternal and omnipresent God. Surely God is in this place, and I did not know it. Jacob didn't know God was with him. He thought he had run too far away from God. But there in the wilderness, he found he could not run too far. He could not sink too low. He could not sin so much that God was not with him. Remember back to the words of Psalm 39 that I read. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there, your right hand shall lead me and hold me fast. Some of you may know the story of Corey Ten Boom, who was imprisoned in a Nazi prison during the Holocaust. She survived that prison and later wrote her story in a book called The Hiding Place. It was also made into a pretty good movie. In the prison camp, surrounded by death and horror, Corey Ten Boom watched her sister Betsy die. And on her deathbed, Betsy whispered to Corey, We must tell people what we have learned here. 
We must tell them that there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. The morning after his experience of God, a new morning full of hope, Jacob built a shrine to commemorate his experience, and he named the place Bethel, Bethel, which means house of God, and he continued on his journey. Would his life be great from now on? No. He would have his ups and downs, and he would be far from perfect, but he did not have to be perfect. The truth is, my friends, if you read the Bible from beginning to end, it seems that God has a special soft spot for less than perfect people, for sinners and outcasts. God never gives up on them, and God manages to do incredible things through them. And in that process, God redeems and transforms their lives. Jacob was a cheat and a liar, and he went on to raise his own dysfunctional family. His sons would include would-be killers and schemers, yet they produced the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses was a fugitive hiding from a murder charge when God came to him. David was a poor, unknown shepherd when God called him to be the next king of Israel. And during his reign, David committed adultery and premeditated murder. Yet God described him as a man after God's own heart. Handpicked by Jesus, the 12 disciples included uneducated fishermen, a much-hated tax collector, and boy, they made a lot of mistakes. The Apostle Paul was a vicious persecutor of Christians, yet became the greatest Christian missionary of his time. And if you read the genealogies of Jesus that are in Scripture, you will find criminals and prostitutes in his family tree. And of course, Jesus himself was a working-class carpenter who wound up executed as a criminal against the state. All these broken people, all these straying people, all these people who may have thought, who am I to serve you, O God? Who am I to you that you care for me? Look what I've done. Look who I am. How can you love me? And yet God does. And we think about ourselves here today. Have any of us ever lain awake in bed at night with your head filled with worry or your heart filled with regret? Have we ever been Jacob, trying to find a little rest in some empty place in our lives, somewhere between a damaged yesterday and an uncertain tomorrow? Of course we have, or we know people who have. We know people who feel that way right now. People who feel they have lost too much, messed up their lives too badly for there to be much hope. The story of the Bible, the story of God's relationship with humanity is not filled with perfect people. It is filled with people who struggle and stumble, who are lost and desperate and sink low. People who make great mistakes and commit great sins. Yet they also find, often when they least expect it, a great and wonderful God who will not give up on them or let go of them. And the truth is, it does not matter whether we can see or hear God in our worst moments. It doesn't matter whether we can feel God's presence in our own wildernesses. We all go through that wilderness, whether it is emotional struggle, whether it is the struggle in our jobs, our relationships, our lives, whether it is the barren wilderness of the pandemic we now find ourselves in. It doesn't matter if we can't feel God in these things. And yes, it is easier to have faith when we can feel God, but our assurance 
and God's promise to us is that even when we can't feel these things, God is always with us, bringing forgiveness and love and offering us new life. And that is good news that we have for everyone who feels abandoned or alone, anyone who feels battered by life and broken by sin. It's good news that we are called to share with the world. But we can only share it if we ourselves have first heard that news and have believed it and have taken it to heart ourselves. Surely God is in this place, whatever this place may be, wherever we find ourselves. Surely God is in this place with us even if we don't always know it. Amen.